Hey everybody, it's Josh Rutledge, your co-host for Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support us more, please head over to our website, fearscapepodcast.com. There you can click on store and browse some really awesome t-shirts and maybe pick a couple up, or even go to our Patreon page and see how you can support us monthly. We love bringing you awesome content just as much as you like listening to it. Enjoy the show. Hello. I'm so glad you could join us. I hope you brought your blanket to hide under. The spooky crew is going to discuss things and events from other realms. Ghosts. Cryptids. Aliens. Be sure to hold your blanket extra tight as the boys take you deep into the fear scale, fear scale, fear scale. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another tantalizing episode of Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. Podcast. Here with the Spooky Crew, yeah! I am your host, Stefan Gearhart, joined as always by my virtual reality co-host, Josh Rowlich. How are you today? Am I allowed to speak now? Because last week I got yelled at because I spoke too soon, so is this, am I allowed to talk now that you've introduced me? Yeah, well, Santosh isn't on and I don't have to try to impress anybody. Okay, okay. So so for anybody uh, who's out there listening right now, this is our, our this is our social distancing episode, right? Yeah, we are doing this via Zoom, uh, not the bad guy from Flash, but the <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the, we're not we're not in the basement studio. And let me uh, tell you, if if you guys have not bought stock in Zoom, now is the time. Yeah, uh, either <laughs> that or uh, or Charmin. Yeah, uh, Zoom, Charmin, and Grubhub, and and possibly Tylenol. With the stupid thing going around oh about don't God. take ibuprofen. So, yeah, we might have to uh, talk about some of that. In- <laughs> I mean, people, you're crazy. You're crazy. Um, anywho, <laughs> speaking of crazy, we yeah. have a super fun show. Uh, if you're listening the day this is dropped, April Fool's Day, bitches. Right. <laughs> it really uh, wasn't COVID-19. It was just yeah, the flu. <laughs> it was COVID-14. Um, no, really. <laughs> no, uh, happy uh, April Fool's Day. So what we wanted to do for April Fool's Day is uh, share with you our top five favorite hoaxes in the paranormal yeah. world. Uh, these are five that we've curated, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and uh, yeah, we've we've curated five, and uh, there's a lot more. Oh, skeptics a will say ton more. All of them are right. All of them are hoaxes. Well, I, I, even one of the ones that I pulled for today's episode, I disagree with. And when I was looking up what to include, <clears throat> I was like, I don't agree with this. Like they had Amityville Horror as a hoax. I know. I they know. Had, I was gonna say they. Amityville is considered right. by skeptics one of the biggest hoaxes out there. So, um, you know, and, and I'm just going to be honest. I, like, I listened to a, another podcast, uh, let's say a, another rival paranormal podcast, <laughs> and uh, and they they were talking a lot about a lot about how uh, the Perrin family. You know, who we just interviewed Andrea a couple episodes back, mm-hmm. that they all made that up just to make money. Which right, is it, ridiculous. it is ridiculous. That's the big thing that all skeptics say is that anybody that even gets the slightest bit, uh, not even money, really, just news footage, is that they're trying to do it for money. That they're trying yeah. to get a book deal. They're trying to get a movie deal. And um, well, I, I think that's incredibly insensitive to the families that went through it. Whether yeah. it happened or not, they thought it did. Right. Well, why do you have to tear somebody down? You know, yeah. okay, so you don't believe in it? That's fine. That's your right. You can choose not to believe. Exactly. Do you but know how many freaking to... movies and books are on Christianity? <laughs> Jesus. Well, yeah, and Jesus, right? So right. Lazarus and Mark and Matthew and, and everybody. And those are else. treated as if they were real, you know. I'm like, well, there's no evidence there either. 
if, if I'm if I'm a 30 year uh, police officer and I write a book about it and I make money off the book, that's okay. Yeah, that's. But if fine. I haven't, but if I have an experience with the paranormal, write a book and make money off of it, it's I lied about the whole thing. Yeah, you're a douchebag. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Which so is anyways, it, interesting, though. I will say this: if you haven't, there's a book. I can't think of the name of it offhand, but it is actually a uh, cop, a detective who became a paranormal investigator due to the uh, cases he was coming across. And uh, he's written a few books, and uh, he's pretty awesome. And there's a movie about it. It's got Eric Bana in it, I believe. Mm. Um, I will try to find that mostly just for you, Josh. But it's a good movie. But, yeah, it's based on a real-life story, a cop that uh, essentially all of a sudden believed into the paranormal because he was part of a uh, exorcism and all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's not Steven Seagal? No. Okay. Because he became a cop, I think. It's Lieutenant Dangle from Dangle from uh, Reno 911. <laughs> Uh, but no, it's really, really good, and I have the internet in front of me, but I don't feel like clickety clacking. So, okay, because we right. gotta get moving. Yeah, we, we got a moving. good show. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about hoaxes. Uh, but this, and I will tell you this: the only hoaxes that we will be talking today about is our topic. So, spooky news, creepy ketchup, anything like that. There will be no April Fool stuff there. Just no, want to put no. that out there. Um, we're not trying to do all that. We're not trying to trick you guys. Um, we, we just want to share some hoaxes. So let's go ahead and move right into our psychic phrase of the week from the Encyclopedic Psychic Dictionary by June Bletzer. Uh, so this week, the term that we have that I, um, you know, just uh, bibliomancied here is uh, subconsciously willed. So what that means is a mental or physical psychic experience that is thought to be unplanned, undesired, and unwilled, happening spontaneously and at random. This excludes the psychic experience that is brought on by a crisis from one's lifestyle, a deceased person, or a loved one. There is no guide from the higher realms. They will instead thrust his or her will upon the psychic to display signs of phenomena or urge to intervene with the psychic unless called upon. The subconscious mind cannot make a decision by itself, therefore cannot be blamed for surfacing without permission. So, so basically, this- <laughs> you're being taken over. So you can look at possession or, uh, though I would say possession is more taking over from the inside, you know? So is this like uh, in the movie Ghost, Whoopi Goldberg sits down and the ghost like, s- sit into her, act, you know, as... You know, using her body, but they're interacting as the ghost or the spirit. Um, again, I would say that that's closer to possession. I would say this is more to be being willed to do something. You know, so like Lethal Weapon Four, where Riggs goes off into the water and Murtaugh's like, "Will it to me, Riggs? Will yeah. it to me?" And that, he's like trying to. You know, that's that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's essentially what I'm talking about. Okay, cool. Anytime I can work Lethal Weapon into the conversation is always a bonus. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I, I love Lethal Weapon movies, man. Um, actually, it's really interesting because uh, I have a buddy whose uh, dad just got laid off and uh, due to the coronavirus, and um, he was supposed to retire in like two weeks. Oh, wow. And they laid him off, and now he they're not sure he's going to be able to get his, his retirement and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Mm. But all I could think of was Lethal Weapon the whole time. I'm just two weeks away from retirement. Yeah, exactly. Like like four movies, and he's like two weeks away from retirement. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, we're gonna move on from that. So yeah, please do not get subconsciously willed by anything. Good luck. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's move right into spooky news. So, for spooky news, I got a fun, weird one. This one comes from the UK. Uh, This comes from the Mirror. uh, And the headline reads, (laughs) be ready for this. The headline reads, Mum freaked out as haunted Frozen doll returns to house after she binned it twice. This is like Frozen from the movie. It's an Elsa doll. Uh, What's bend it? Bend it means thrown it away. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do it. They bend it. Okay, in like, day. like B I N. Yeah, bend, like in a B E N D. No, like a rubbish bin. Okay, 
Gotcha. They bend it. Um, so a family has been left feeling rather freaked out after one of their daughter's Christmas presents returned to their home after being put in the rubbish bin twice. It's no secret that dolls can be pretty creepy. We've seen enough horror movies to know that. But one thing we didn't think would prove quite so scary is a Disney toy. But one woman has been left terrified of a piece of frozen merchandise her young child was given for Christmas. A mother from Houston has taken to social media to reveal why she believes her daughter, Ari, Ar Aurelia, has a haunted Elsa doll. Oh, okay, so this comes from England, but the story is about someone from Houston, Texas. Hmm. So, uh, all right. Says, in a viral post on Facebook that has now been deleted, Emily Madonia explained that uh, Aurelia's toy had first started to freak them out when it began singing and talking in Spanish while switched off. She and her husband, Matt, one T, decided to throw the doll out with the daughter's blessing, but since then it has found its way back into their home, not once, but twice. It goes on to say, Emily wrote, Matt threw it away weeks ago, and then we found it inside on a wooden bench. And okay, so we were weirded out and tightly wrapped it in its own garbage bag and put that garbage bag inside another garbage bag filled with another garbage bag in our garbage and put it in the bottom of our garbage can underneath a bunch of other garbage bags of garbage and wheeled it to the curb and it was collected on garbage day. Jeez, they said garbage a lot. Uh, the family then went on vacation thinking the whole thing was behind them. But when they returned home, the doll was back. Aurelia says, we were out of town, forgot about it. Or no, sorry, the mother said that. Uh, today, Aurelia says, mom, I saw the Elsa doll again in the backyard. And after throwing it out, didn't work. Emily decided that the only way to be rid of the thing for good was to send it far, far away. So she posted it in the mail to her friend Chris who lives 1,500 miles away and has been entertained by the tale of the haunted doll. She confirmed that Chris has since received Elsa and has taped the creepy toy to the bonnet of his car to stop it from going anywhere else. Fingers <laughs> crossed that it stays there. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, really, so here comes the dad joke. They, they couldn't just let it go. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why is this not in this article? I know they like missed a great punchline. I'm kind of, oh, there's another, hold on, there's another piece. It says, unsurprisingly, people on Facebook were shocked by the post. Uh, one person commented, you should have burned it. If it doesn't burn, then it's possessed. Another said, I have thoroughly enjoyed following the saga, but please let me know if the doll returns. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, again, nobody's saying, let it go, yeah. let it go. Well, and it's what's funny. really, I, I think, I think somebody's probably messing with them, right? Yeah. Like, I feel like that's, I mean, it could I'd be, do it. don't get me wrong, it could be very much paranormal related, but I feel like maybe the first time when they threw it out, somebody like saw it and they picked it up, brought it back in the house thinking it was accidental. And then when they made a big deal about it, then somebody really would have like, let's go, we're going to mess with these. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like I said, I would totally do it. Yeah. <clears throat> I would do it in a heartbeat. And who knows, it, it, somebody could have gone to Walmart and just picked up another one. They could have bought like five. And just oh yeah! Oh have man! Them in the closet. Have them come out. Be like, oh my god, it's gremlins! Somebody poured water on them. <laughs> you know, my my daughters have um, they're they're recreations, but they're the the original looking Cabbage Patch dolls, mm -hmm. and they freak my wife out. They freak Kristen out. So, uh, one night I like brought one in and I set it at the foot of the, the bed so that when she rolled over in the middle of the night, there'd be like this doll sitting at the foot. Of the bed. <laughs> I'm a loving husband. <laughs> hey, I mean, y'all know the data story here. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think that shit's hilarious. Um, but yeah, so that's the spooky news. So um, y'all watch out for Elsa. Uh, they're haunted and speaking Spanish, apparently. Um, so yeah, that's La La Rona is now Elsa. <laughs> well, and I, I'd imagine that a lot of those toys do come like loaded with other, um, you know, uh, languages. Oh, sure. You can just switch it. You can just switch. You know, like the, it's like the whole thing around the uh, uh, Toy Story four or, or three when Buzz gets switched to Spanish. Oh yeah. Oh you yeah. You know, so it's just like I'm sure they all come kind of preloaded with different languages. Maybe like well, three, three or three different languages, and then he just for whatever it's going to be bought for, and if it's going to be sold primarily in the place to speak Spanish. You 
sell it in the Spanish language. So I mean, I had a Furby when it came out, and I'm pretty sure it was possessed. I'm sure everybody's got Furby stories about being possessed. I mean, mine got stuck on a laugh when I got really, really scared one time. <laughs> It scared the hell out of me. I remember you and Aaron had one, like, the, yeah. each had one, and they would, like, talk to each other. Yeah, we would bring them to class to freak out um, the English teacher, and uh, we, we convinced everybody in our English class. So this teacher, I can't remember her name, at Campbellsville, she claimed to be abducted by aliens, and okay. she was our English teacher. And it was kind of one of those things that everybody knew, but nobody really talked about. Um, but Aaron and I, uh, we didn't care. And so we would ask about it all the time and she had a crazy eye too. But anyways, we, we got for, they had just come out and, uh, Aaron's mom got us each one. And, uh, we told everybody in class that we were going to have these things going and to not say anything, to act like (laughs) nobody heard anything. And she flipped out and she's like, you guys don't hear that. And everybody's like, no. (laughs) What is that? She lost her mind until she followed the sound and found that they were in our backpacks and she kicked us out of class <laughs> at college. That's what yeah. we're well, at a Christian know. college. Too. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, turn so, the other, turn yeah, the other Furby. Then later on that Furby got possessed and got stuck on a laugh. I got really, really scared. I felt like it was one of my um, Campbellsville stories where I felt like I was kind of being psychically attacked by a ghost or something like that. I kind of felt like I got held down. Some scary stuff was happening and I was talking to either uh, Santosh or our other friend, and I was telling them how scared I was, and um, there was like this sharp energy moment, and then all of a sudden the Furby goes, Lulu, ah, 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 and it just gets stuck on that. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I threw that sucker out the window. Changed batteries, you know. Yep. Well, it's like, yeah, if you have a, uh, a Tickle Me Elmo doll back when they had those, and if the battery ran down, it'd be like, ha, 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 yeah. ha, <laughs> uh, tickles. Uh, uh, uh. So. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's spooky news. Let's get into our uh, UFO sighting of the week, please. All right, what do we got, Hashe? Yeah, so uh, this is Hashua, by the way. Um, Hashua. This is uh, coming to us from Gonzales, California. Ooh. Um, it was Speedy, seen- Speedy lives there. <clears throat> Anyways, um, it was seen on Wednesday, March 18th. Uh, so just like, what, last week? Um, it was uh, it saw it for an hour. That's like, that's like, Gets back to, so this one is actually related a little bit to our sighting that we shared mm. in the Android episode. So yeah. it says, <clears throat> I don't know why I was prompted to look out of my window, but I was immediately drawn to a blinking star-like object in the sky. Multiple colors were flashing. It was the size of a planet in the sky at first. For the previous three days, I had an overwhelming sensation of being followed or stalked. Also having dreams of unknown entities chasing me and trying to harm or capture me. And such a deep fear that for two of the three days, my chest and neck felt suffocated. Pressurized and sore. The morning before I noticed the orb in the sky, I woke up with paper cut like scratches and a tough, invisible, sharp, glass-like and metal-like debris. Some sil- slivered and some round microparticles on my hands and face. I felt nauseous and irritable all day before. Headache, weak stomach, body aches, dizzy, and distracted. When I saw the star-like entity, I felt that it had been on its way for quite some time to make itself apparent to me. I've never felt such a feeling of something unknown somehow having such a controlling or intriguing presence manifestation i am uneasy writing this as i can still see the entity as well as feel it outside of my window the object has changed in shape it's no longer emitting a multicolored light from what i can see just camouflaged as an obvious yet otherwise normal looking star in the sky as not many stars are visible tonight 
and this one is extra bright, like the North Star, for example, but in the east and slowly elevating in the atmosphere. I'm also uneasy because when I saw it, I felt like there was an entity inside of the craft that was intimate bond with me, as though it is responsible for previous lucid dreams I have experienced, or it has specific reason for eluding me. It also disappeared from view for a few minutes, but I could intuitively feel that it moved to the northwest side of the house, which was out of view. Then I witnessed a shadow figure approach me quickly as though it descended from my living room ceiling. I began to feel suffocated and feverish. A few minutes later, it appeared into my view again in the east and began to slowly and almost unapparently ascend higher into the sky. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of got me a little messed up, man. So that that one, like the shadow thing coming yeah. from like her her ceiling, that reminds me of a lot of your uh, night hags. And I don't yeah. want to freak I don't want to freak you out too much, but like, I mean, what if what if your night hags are et ut? I, you know, uh, Brad and I used to talk about it all the time that there's a connection. One of his night hags that he had, uh, he's had he's had both positive and negative experiences and one of them they led him to his backyard and he saw a ship and um some things like that he's also had times where he said that he's like shifted consciousness and found himself on an operating table so you know uh, it could be yeah i mean there there is a lot of theories that night hags are indeed um that they are indeed extraterrestrial or ultra terrestrial. That's, that's why we can't move that they, you know, have some sort of um, uh, anesthesia or something like that, you know, and that we, our conscious brain wakes up, but our body is still yeah. numb. Well, it, so a couple of things that I uh, noticed while I was reading that. So for those who are listening, you know, as we said in the beginning, this is our social distancing episode. So I'm, I can see a video of Stefan and Stefan can see a video of me so we can interact better with each other as we do the show. Mm -hmm. Well, as I started to read that account, your video started doing weird stuff and like, I see the, it doing it right now. And like the, the, it's almost like it's losing or, or changing focus. It's like pulsating. Yeah. And then, you know, I've got in the studio down here, I've got that window that's off on the far wall. Mm -hmm. So I just instinctually glanced at that window. Let's see if this makes a difference. And something moved outside of the window. So we have a, we have a cat of our neighbors that likes to roam around our house. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to tell myself it's the cat. So I don't like freak out of my skin right now. Mm. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just really weird that I was reading that. And your video started like doing this weird like pulsing focusing thing. Yeah, I and see it. I see it doing it now. Yeah. I wonder if it's because it's a little darker, the lights in front of me, not behind me. And so Yeah, but but you're really illuminated, so you would think it would focus on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well it was that that you know, when we were doing those Estes sessions in the car uh, a few weeks back and we posted one up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um if you actually watch that video, it does it does some of that kind of weird like it doesn't focus in and out, but what it does is it gets lighter and darker over like throughout the entire length of the hmm. video. Hmm. Interesting. Really Interesting. Well, let's go ahead and slide right into creepy catch up then. Cause we're already starting to get spooky. Ooky. Yep. Creepy catch up. Creepy catch up. Creepy catch up. Creepy catch up. Y'all it's creepy. Okay, so uh, creepy catch up, man. It, it has been a spooky week for sure. I have had some crazy dreams. I have, I, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that I haven't been able to sleep, you know, and our friend, the theologian, him and I were up super late last night and uh, chit chatting and uh, we we're just up, man. And my brother who lives in Monheim, Germany, um, I hit him at like 6 p.m. our time and was like, hey, you up? 
And uh, of course he hits me at like four in the morning. He goes, I'm up now. I'm guessing you're up. And I was like, son of a bitch. He's like, well, you're a night owl. I figured you'd be up. And, <laughs> um, and he's like, well, you got laid off. It's not like you have any time to do anything or that you have all the time to do anything. So, um, but yeah, so we were chit chatting and, and stuff like that. It was like four in the morning. And then I ended up waking up still at like seven thirty, and I woke up sweating like, and like my panic sensors were going you know like I, whatever i was dreaming whoo i mean i thought i ran a marathon and sarah was already up and working and stuff but i i, I felt i was like out of breath i was like i got the corona <laughs> um uh but yeah it, it was crazy and then i've been having a lot of like um like uh i don't know like brushes and touches and and like things out of the corner of my eyes lately because i've been spending a lot of time home i guess and i've been feeling the energies that are here a lot more and like i've been feeling it, it you know feeling taps on the on the shoulder um like there was one point i thought sarah came up behind me was playing with my hair nobody was there hmm. nobody was there you know and i've been seeing little things out of the corner of my eyes um and stuff like that and 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 it's like i've been like I feel like I'm tapping in. This is a very psychic thing, but I feel like I'm tapping in. I drove up to Louisville is famous for this thing called Hot Rod Haven, where a lot of people in the 50s and 60s and stuff used to hot rod race, and a lot of people died, and it's really curvy and on top of a hill, and there's a cemetery there, and I went up there, and um, but man, I mean, I could feel the energy of that place in the cemetery. I could just, I felt like eyes were watching me, mm. and there was nobody there. And, um, so yeah, it was really, really weird. It's just, I mean, nothing like, like big stuff has happened, but man, it's just like a ton of little things have been happening this week. Tons. And yeah, that's, that's what's been happening with me. Yeah. I haven't had, um, other than the, the same kind of, uh, feeling like there's something in the woods behind my house. I just, I feel like there's something back there. Um, and then, I also have had just a lot of dreams uh, like, you know, I think I sent you the one or I told you about the one where um, I had a dream that we were doing an investigation in like Detroit, oh, yeah. Toledo uh, with like Keith age and, and Tom Bonner and his crew. And uh, we were up there doing that investigation and like, we saw something move Like we were up on like a balcony, whatever building we were in and we saw something move in the, in the, in the area below. So we went down to investigate we ended up going outside to like a courtyard and in the night sky, <clears throat> you and I saw like a UFO and we like, does anybody else see that in the group? And everybody looked up and like, Oh yeah, what is that? And right about that time, like this humongous circular UFO flew over top of us. And it had like that, um, that uh, camouflage like they have in the Avengers movies and stuff where like, Oh it's, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, <clears throat> it makes it look almost invisible. Cloak. You just see like the night sky above it. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing was, is that the night sky was cloudy above it, but the bottom of the ship, the, the ship or the craft, whatever you want to call it, was like starry. Well, you know, Andrea has always said her favorite time to look for uh, UFOs in the sky is when it's cloudy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in I, I just remember there was a couple, like there was a couple of um, uh, factors for the for the dream. So one, because we were with all those folks, I really felt like we were in michigan or or, or 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 toledo michigan area yeah uh doing this <clears throat> number two i remember when the ufo flew over i looked at my watch and it was uh 9 47 p.m and i could make out august of 2020 but i can't make out the the day right which is funny because due to corona um they've canceled the midwest paranormal con that i was going to go to with santosh to go visit andrea um and they've moved it to august and it also coincides with uh another con that's in michigan so that's really really interesting and then there was another indicator uh for me in the night sky i could see the moon and the moon was in a um for the for the for the people who know phases of the moon it was in a um a waning mm -hmm. uh, gibbons yeah. So I, I almost want to kind of like look up because because I think they have a date now for there's two there's two up in that area. There's there's the Midwest Con, which is like I think they set it for August 1st. 
And then there's another one um, that's up there that's like uh, August 27th, I believe. I kind of want to look at those two dates and see what the what the uh, phase of the moon is supposed to be for those two dates. Yeah, that'd be see interesting. Which one of those, you know, I was, you know, we were, I was witnessing or experiencing or dreaming about or whatever the case may yeah. be. So, well, the other thing you forgot to talk about was the night, which was a, probably the night before, where we both had a dream about Andrea Perrin. Yeah. So my dream was just simply that uh, we were sitting with her. Uh, I think it was just actually her and I, I don't think you were in it, but um, that her and I were sitting on this like outdoor patio couch, you know, and we were just having like the, mo- no, 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 that was Vashti. Vashti was the outdoor patio couch. Yeah, but, we were, she- we were inside of Andrea's home because she had been showing pictures of like her TV and things like that. So I dreamed about that, that her and I were um, having conversations like incredibly deep conversations. And it's really interesting because that so you were there on that i got it mixed up with the vashti dream so it was you and i hanging out with andrea having just an incredibly deep conversation and you know my dream with vashti was having that deep conversation as well so well and then uh my dream with andrea, same night yeah same same night. same night was that uh the three of us were doing a panel at a con mm-hmm. and we were talking about some really awesome like et or ut footage that somebody or we or somebody had captured and we were like doing this panel and we were talking about it me you yeah. and adria so that's crazy i guess that's better than a uti panel <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. man uh keep it keeping it keeping it real for the covid listeners out there for the listeners out there yeah. so real quick before we wrap up uh, creepy catch up. I just want to check in and see how you're doing. I haven't seen you in a week and uh, you know, COVID's crazy and we just want to remind people, make sure to social distance and just stay safe so we can all get back to uh, going outside. Cause I'm an extrovert and I'm losing my damn mind. Yeah. Same here. I, I actually got to, uh, I got to drive and get dinner for the fam tonight. So I got to get out of the house a little bit and I know you went for a drive today as well, mm-hmm. but I did, but I, that that helps but i really need like people intervention so yeah so we are going to be doing um a fearscape unhinged episode or two uh outdoors uh this weekend as a way to kind of be able to social distance we're going to get our chairs six feet apart we're going to be outside um and we're going to try to do that and see how that goes so that'll be interesting we're going to try to do that at either waverly or a cemetery or something like that yep that ought to be fun yep and it's supposed to be, uh, I think the night we're talking about is supposed to be clear, so maybe we'll get to see our uh, star UFO guy again. Maybe, maybe. No hugs, though. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Drugs, not hugs, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a pug, so I'm going to say pugs, not hugs. Pugs, not hugs, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's uh, move into our topic tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, our top five favorite hoaxes uh, of the paranormal. All right, so like I said, happy April Fool's Day, everybody. I'm Josh, and I'm coming at you. Uh, no, just kidding. This is Stefan, April Fool's. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, totally got you. Um, no, we're going to be talking about some hoaxes that we find very, very interesting. Um, there's a, a crap ton of them we talked about, um, and ones that we – and you may disagree with these, though. We tried to find – the ones best we could that kind of proved that they were hoaxes that, you know, um, or, or even like they, the people who did them came out and said, yep, right, right. All, and you know. even then, like, I'm still not, that's, there's a reason Bigfoot's not on here, even though supposedly, according to his son, that when he died, the main guy that has that really, that famous Bigfoot, it's, he claimed on his deathbed that that was all a hoax that he dressed up in a suit and recorded all that. But well, know, and we, there's no proof that he actually said that. So, you know, we talked about it even on the Vatican episode, the guy who did the Corona vision, apparently on his deathbed, you know, yeah. said it was all you know made up or whatever, you know, so people may have their own reasons for why they come out and say that something is a hoax or, mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. And so it's not really for us to decide. We're just going to convey the information to you guys, what we found. And then, you can yeah. decide if you think it's a hoax yeah, the, or not. So these are top five that are considered widely to be hoaxes. Yep. 
there's really not much question on a lot of these. Yeah. That's where we're going to go with. <clears throat> so, uh, and I hate, st- I hate the first one. I hate the first one. Oh no. Cause it's, you know, that's, that's the other thing that I'll say here is that all of these and any of them like them, um, really just set the stage for all of the non-believers to point at everything that might actually be legitimate. Oh and yeah. Say, you know, well, the other one was a hoax, so this one must be a hoax too. Yeah, uh, and this one. So I'm not. I'm gonna uh, blow your wad here, but the first one is the Fox <laughs> Sisters, and the reason I hate that the Fox Sisters is on this list is because they are the reason the spiritualist movement happened. Right. Like that whole. I mean, where we get our idea of mediums and 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 t- like just everything, like the whole idea of the wrappings and everything come from the Fox sisters. Like they started it all and it, it all went from there. And so yep. then it, it makes you go was every other spirit, spiritualist thing false after that. Right. That's what it makes a skeptic. Yeah. Say. Right. Exactly. So anyways, I won't steal your thunder anymore. Kaboom. Okay. Boom. Boom goes the dynamite. So <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in 1848, uh, the two younger sisters, Catherine or Kate age 10 and Margareta or Maggie, age fourteen. <laughs> Stephanie, you're messing me up. <laughs> <laughs> we can't so the, do video anymore. <laughs> no. He's holding up our uh, cool new business cards that we got that have like an alien face on them. They're really cool. So if you guys happen to be out and about and you see us somewhere, ask and we'll give you one. So yep, I gave anyways, one out today. Uh we're living in a house in Hydesville, New York with their parents. Uh Hydesville no longer exists but was a hamlet that was part of the township of Arcadia in Wayne County, New York. So just outside of of Newark. Newark. Yeah. I wonder what it is now. What the, so that the city itself doesn't live, it's not existent. So is it just now? It was probably just absorbed. Annexed. Yeah. Annexed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, you know, before we moved to where we are now, we, we lived in an, in a neighborhood that was uh, annexed by the city that was close to, and when it was done, all the only thing we got out of it was uh, snow, like snowplow treatment, mm-hmm. and uh, city police. That was it. So all right, and now it's all metro, so it doesn't even matter. Yeah, because yeah, there used to be in Louisville city and county cops. Now they're all just one. Yep. And do you remember that rivalry that they had? Oh yeah. Well, the, a lot of people don't realize, and this we're getting off topic. But a lot of people don't realize that metro. Uh, and like Louisville and County that became Metro, there's a lot of cities around Louisville that stayed townships. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like I think Jeff- Anchorage is one. Yeah, and- Anchorage, J Town, St. Matthews. Yep. There's a bunch. So, Shively. <clears throat> so, anyways, back on topic. Stay on topic. Stay <laughs> on topic. <laughs> the house had some reputation for being haunted, but it wasn't until late March that the family began to be frightened by unexplained sounds that at times sounded like knocking and at other times sounded like moving a furniture. Okay. In 1888, Margareta told her story of the origins of the mysterious wrappings. So is this, I got to ask, so is this like, is this run DMC? Is this run DMC? Or is this like the Edgar Allan Poe, you know, it came rapping, rapping upon my door. Ooh, I wonder if, uh, those are tied together. Like if that's where, uh, Poe, picked up that term from rapping yeah i was i was wondering about that too when i was putting huh. all this together because it would have been around the same time right poe was yeah around. i mean if, if 1888 i mean yeah you're looking around poe's time yep po so Dan. it says here uh, <laughs> uh when we went to bed at night we used to tie an apple to a string and move the string up and down causing the apple to bump on the floor Or we would drop the apple on the floor, making a strange noise every time it would rebound. Mother listened to this for a time. She would not understand it and did not suspect us as being capable of a trick because we were so young. So what you're saying is is they flat out and came out and said that they... they, Yeah. Okay. God, I didn't know this. I mean, I knew that the Fox Sixers... Uh, sexters woo uh, the fox <laughs> sisters um had been disproven but i didn't know they disproved themselves <laughs> <That> was, <yeah. laughs> so it says that during the night of march 31st kate challenged the invisible noisemaker presumed to be a spirit to repeat the snaps of her fingers 
Uh, it says, I used to sleep on the floor. It did. Uh, what was it? Uh, sleep on the floor. It did. It, it was asked to wrap out the ages of the girls. It did. The neighbors were called in. Over the course of the next few days, a code was developed where raps could signify yes or no in response to a question or be used to indicate a letter of the alphabet. Hey, at this point, if they're accepting this and one of the girls is missing, that's where you should have known better. Yeah, well, this is the 1800s. Yeah, I guess so. Same with the Bell Witch, I guess. Yeah. Uh, The girls addressed the spirit as Mr. Splitfoot. Oh, what a horrible (laughs) name. Well, it says here's the nickname for the devil. Oh, so it'd be like a hoof, not like yeah. a split foot. I watch too much horror movies. <laughs> too many horror movies. Too many people tied to a log sit down a, with a saw blade, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. I mean, I just imagine somebody's foot getting axed right down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right. So uh, on to bigger and better things. Um <laughs> and alleged that the entity creating the sounds claimed to be the spirit of a peddler named Charles B. Rosna. Ooh, that's had, too close to C. Rona, man. I'm just saying. <laughs> who had been murdered five years earlier and buried in the cellar. Why not? That's a good place to be buried. Yeah. Uh, in his writings on the Fox sisters, Arthur Conan Doyle. Ooh, I love Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, claimed the neighbors dug up the cellar and found a few pieces of bone. No missing person named Charles B. Rosna was ever identified. Now, wasn't it you talking about uh, basements being like, why is there like dirt areas in the basement or something like that? Like, why are those creepy? Or was it Keith well, talking about that? I mean, I remember us talk, having the conversation, but... Yeah, that it's always like these dirt areas of a basement that are always the most haunted. Like well, unfinished areas that are right. dirt floors. Well, and you know, we, we've talked a little bit about this in the past where... Um, that like things in the in a transition from being to being built like when we even when we had uh, uh, Steve Stanick on mm-hmm. and he was talking about his dad's house and how his dad you know was like knocked out the wall and was building a structure onto the back mm-hmm. of the house and while all of that was going on activity picked up and then as soon as the room was completed it kind of died down again no right. pun intended <laughs> So, you know, it, it, if you have a, a dirt cellar, it's almost like it's not completely transitioned to yeah. a final basement. Hmm. And so it kind of gets stuck in the in-between space. And so maybe that's why there's more activity in unfinished basements. Interesting. Unfinished business, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So punny. <laughs> um. Now, Margareta, as, as you might recall, was Maggie Fox, and her later years noted they, meaning the neighbors, were convinced that someone had been murdered in the house. They asked the spirits through us about it, and we would wrap one for the spirit answer yes, not three as we did afterward. The murder, they concluded, must have been committed in the house. They went over the whole surrounding county trying to get the names of people who had formerly lived in the house. Finally, they found a man by the name of Bell. And they said that this poor innocent man had committed a murder in the house and that the noises had come from the spirit of the murdered person. Poor Bell was shunned and looked upon by the whole community as a murderer. Oh, my God. So this is this is a, a, like a really good example of people who want to believe and then somebody else taking advantage of that belief. Yes. Oh, my God. So they basically made this guy a pariah? Yeah. Wow. With Not, no evidence. None. None. None whatsoever. Wow. Oh, man. It's crazy times is what it used to be back then. <laughs> so uh, let's get into a little bit of their time as mediums. Mm, what about medium rares? Well, it wasn't, I mean, I guess it was rare to have mediums in the, in the 1800s. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I, see what, I see what you did there. Um, <laughs> Kate and Margareta were sent to nearby Rochester during the excitement. Kate to the house of her sister, Leah, uh, now married as Leah Foxfish. <laughs> Fox Beautiful Fish. name. Yeah. Beautiful name. <clears throat> and Margareta to the home of her brother, David. And the wrappings followed them. Of course they did, because they were making it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, 
Amy and Isaac Post, a radical Quaker couple and longstanding friends of the Fox family, invited the girls into their Rochester home. Immediately convinced of the uh, genuineness of the phenomena, they helped to spread the word among their radical Quaker friends who became the early core of spiritualists. Yep, I was going to say the Quakers were, were very spiritualist. I had no idea that the Fox sisters were a part of that because the Quakers are in a lot of ways similar to the Shakers as well. What's the Quakers and the Shakers? Quakers and the Shakers. In this way um, appeared the association between spiritualism and radical political causes such as uh, abolition. There you go. Thank you. Temperance and equal rights for women. I, 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 my mind is blown right now. I had no idea that the, the Fox sisters are the reason why the Quakers turned their, their whole movement. That's crazy. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, I'm sure they were just a small part of it. I'm sure there was more to it than that. Yeah, but the Quakers were definitely known for spiritualism, but still very, very interesting. Now, on the 14th of November, excuse me, 1849, the Fox sisters demonstrated their spiritualist rapping at the Corinthian Hall in Rochester. This was the first demonstration of spiritualism held before a paying public. Oh, they were getting paid. Yeah. And but inaugurated. They, they yeah, but I mean, you know. It, yeah, this, was, this, <laughs> one turned out, this one turned out true. Bully right. for you skeptics. Yeah. And inaugurated a long history of public events featuring, uh, featured by spiritualist mediums and leaders in the United States and in other countries. Mm-hmm. The Fox Girls became famous in their public seances in New York in 18, 18, 1850, attracted notable people including William Cullen Bryant, George Bancroft, James Fenimore Cooper, Nathaniel Parker Willis, Horace Greeley, Sojourney Weaver, I mean, Sojourner Truth. <laughs> Sojourner Truth. <laughs> and William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, I've only heard of three of those. I've heard of William Cullen Bryant, Sojourner Truth, and William Lloyd Garrison. Yep. They also attracted imitators during the following few years. Hundreds of people claimed to, be, to have the ability to communicate with the spirits. Whoopi Goldberg. Yep. Kate and Margaret became well-known mediums, giving seances for hundreds of people. Many of these early seances were entirely frivolous, where sitters sought insight into the state of railway stocks or the issue of love affairs. Hmm. But the religious significance of communication with the deceased soon became apparent. Horace Greeley, the prominent publisher, publisher and politician, became a kind of protector for them enabling their movement in higher social circles. But the lack of parental supervision was pernicious as both of the young women began to drink wine. <laughs> well, because they can afford it now. Yeah. So let's move into the confession. All right. In 1851, Miss Norman Culver, a relative of the Fox family, admitted in a signed statement that she had assisted them during their seances by touching them to indicate when the raps should be made. She also claimed that Kate and Margaret revealed to her the method of producing the raps by snapping their toes and using their knees and ankles. And actually, when I was looking into this, there's a whole several people tested how they were doing this, and it basically came down to that their joints, the way that they were made or whatever, they could pop. It's like when you think about your pop your knuckles. Yeah. They were popping their joints, and that's what was making the rapping. I, I can pop my joints. I can do my – I can pop my foot all the time. I can pop not that. Toe. It's not that loud, but, I mean, right now I'm, like, shifting my ankle, and it's going click, 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 click. I can, uh, I can pop my big toe, and it's pretty loud. I mean, you can't hear it on the show. <laughs> and I can also pop my collar, but um, nothing, nothing on that. Okay, nope, sorry. I'm not, not going to give you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Pop it like it's hot. Pop it like it's hot. There you go. Okay. Hot pocket. Yeah. So uh, over the years, sisters Kate and Margaret had developed serious drinking problems. Around 1888, they became embroiled in a quarrel with their sister Leah and other leading spiritualists who were concerned that Kate was drinking too much to care properly for her children. Hmm. 
At the same time, Margaret, contemplating a return to the Roman Catholic faith, became, ah. became convinced that her powers were diabolical. Eager, eager to harm Leia as much as possible, the two sisters traveled to New York City, where a reporter offered $1,500 if they would expose their methods and give him an exclusive on the story. <laughs> Margaret appeared publicly at the New York Academy of Music on October 21st, 1888, with Kate present. Before an audience of 2,000, Margaret demonstrated how she could produce, at will, raps audible throughout the theater. Doctors from the audience came on stage to verify that the cracking of her toe joints was the source of the sound. Jeez! You need to get your feet fixed, man. <laughs> that's split foot. That's, that's, yeah. that's why it's called I, split foot. Nobody's giving her a massage. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret told her story of the origins of the mysterious wrappings in a signed confession given to the press and published in New York World, October 21st, 1888. In it, she explained the Hydesdale events. She expanded on her career as a medium after leaving the homestead to begin her spiritual travels with her older sister, Mrs. Underhill. This is a quote. Mrs. Underhill, the eldest sister, took Katie and me to Rochester. There it was that we discovered a new way to make the wraps. My sister Katie was the first to observe that by swishing her fingers, she could produce certain noises with her knuckles and joints and that the same effect could be made with the toes. Finding that we could make wraps with our feet, first with one foot and then with both, we practiced until we could do this easily when the room was dark. Like most perplexing things when made clear, it is astonishing how easily it is done. The wrapping is simply the result of perfect control of the muscles of the leg below the knee which govern the tendons of the foot and allow the action of the toe and ankle bones that are not commonly known. Such perfect control is only possible when the child is taken at an early age and carefully and continually taught to practice the muscles, which grow stiffer in later years. This, then, is the simple explanation of the whole method of knocks and wraps. Wow. So it was a developed skill. That's yes. crazy. It's like premeditated you know. <laughs> yeah premeditating lies and yeah. and like they gave all this away for money i mean i guess uh, what you got the uh, inflation calculator what's 1500 bucks in 1888 compared to now uh give me a second to look okay. that up but i'm just like yeah that like for money i'm like and and the one that would became catholic she probably would have confessed on her deathbed well and and they did it well they did it for money and also to to get back at their older sister yeah, because one thing that I read about the Foxes is that the older sister Leia was like their manager, so she was out like booking the gigs and doing the seances and all this kind of stuff. So you know she was probably taking a cut. So she was probably, you know, they were all drinking and drinking their their money away, and she was sitting mm -hmm. back in her house and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, um, she also wrote a great many people when they hear the rabbing imagine at once that the spirits are touching them. It is very common delusion. Some very wealthy people came to see me years ago when I lived in 42nd Street. I did some wrappings for them. I, married this, I made the spirit wrap on the chair, and one of the ladies cried out, I feel the spirit tapping me on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was pure imagination. Hmm. So uh, quickly, uh, $1,500 in 1888 would be roughly about $45,000 today. So that's a good chunk of change for the that's, exclusive rights to a story. A good chunk of change for sure. And I mean, we see this in church and different things like that. A lot of the Benny Hinn stuff, um, a lot of these false preachers that do healings and stuff like that, that they do. They are able to elicit these responses from people without even making them do it. Yep. So, yeah, um, the other thing that I have here is that Harry Houdini, the magician who devoted a large part of his life to debunking spiritualist claims, provided this insight. As to the delusion of sound, 
Sound waves are deflected just as light waves are reflected by the intervention of a proper medium and under certain conditions, it is a difficult thing to locate their source. Stuart Cumberland told me that an interesting test to prove the inability of a blindfolded person to trace sound to its source. It is exceedingly simple, merely clinking two coins over the head of the blindfolded person. Yeah, I mean, Houdini, it's really, really interesting how associated he is, you know, for someone whose job it was to fool people, you know, like he wanted to make sure that people weren't fooling people. Right. I mean, it's, it's really, it is really weird. Yet in the end, he was actually very convinced by everything um, purportedly that in the end he actually became a really big spiritualist and he told his wife or kid or whomever, he was like, when I die, I'm going to come back and I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you. So look, look for me. And he was going to, he wanted to try to figure out a way to actually connect. So, Mm. so lastly, it says here that's pressured by the spiritualist movement and her own dire financial circumstances. Margaret recanted her confession in writing in November, 1889, about a year after her exhibition. She attempted to return to spiritualist performances, but never again attracted the attention or paying clientele of the sisters' earlier careers. Within a few years, both sisters died in poverty, shunned by former supporters, and were buried in pauper's graves. Wow. All three sisters are interned in Brooklyn, New York. Wow. That's messed up to think about their legacy, whether good or bad, like to be buried in a pauper's grave is is nuts. And there's so many like famous artists, same thing, like that they weren't famous at the time, you know? Right. Exactly. Yep. So I know that was a really big one. Uh, You know, again, whether you, um, you know, believe, did, did they say all of that because they needed money and they wanted to hurt their sister? And none of it was true or, you know, were they faking the whole time? You know, that's not up for us to decide. It's just for you to decide as a listener. So, yeah. Um, so moving on to, and now I remember this one. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. Oh yeah. So, oh, so this I remember is, this too. <laughs> so this is alien autopsy. Oh my um, God. I watched the hell out of this <laughs> man. So in uh, 1995, the Fox Television Network, uh, probably not related to the Fox Sisters, yeah, just happens well, to follow. <laughs> I mean, the Fox is all about fake news, am I right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, aired a special called Alien Autopsy Fact or Fiction. God, which, I remember this. Which be, I remember them like hyping it up. like Oh, it, for weeks. Yeah, because I remember it was like um, – it was like right in the middle of the X Files was on, and they were like they would like show all these commercials right after before X Files episodes, and yeah, it was yeah. But, so so this was ninety five. Was this the uh, was this around the fiftieth anniversary of Roswell too? It's close. So Roswell was in forty seven. Forty seven. Okay, so it's the ninety five. So yeah, yeah, close, close to fifty yeah. years. So I mean, there everybody was hot on Roswell at this time. Yeah. Well, and again, because the show The X-Files was really big, Mm -hmm. it basically says that in a ratings bonanza and a pop culture phenomenon catapulting the topic of UFOs back into the national conversation. Capitalizing on the popularity of its cult hit The X-Files, Fox bought 17 minutes of grainy footage from British TV producer (laughs) Ray Santilli claiming to record a secret U.S. military autopsy oh. of an alien life form recovered from a UFO crash site near Roswell, New Mexico. The footage reportedly brought, excuse me, bought from a retired military cameraman shows the bloody corpse of a hairless, large-headed alien with reptilian eyes being roughly dissected by a team of doctors in protective surgical gear. The shaky camera work and blurred close-ups lend a sense of realism to the footage while making it exceptionally difficult to get a good look at the creature or its gooey innards. 
this again, this is this is like one of the things where the whole um, Stan Romanek. So like yeah. here you have this alien autopsy thing, which the camera's all over the place and it's all out of, all like it's all out of focus and you can't see anything. And then you got Stan Romanek and it's like on a freaking tripod then like he's waiting for them to just pop their head around like out mm-hmm. the window. So anyway, so although most TV viewers immediately dismiss the footage as fake, the light, rubbery flesh of the alien was hard to ignore. Producer Santilli vouched for its authenticity, at least until 2006, when Santilli began promoting a second alien autopsy film, this one a mockumentary about the filming of the original. In press interviews, Santilli confessed the truth, that the original footage was irreparably damaged during transport from the U.S. to England and that he hired a team of special effects artists and actors to restore the lost footage for the special. Wow. So, I mean, could it have been originally on the on the film? I don't know, but again, he just he kills his credibility by saying, yeah, you know, it was in there, we just, we lost it, so we made it up again, so. Jeez, man. What I want to know, what I want to know is how much Fox paid for this. Because everything that I read was that it cost these guys around 39000 to make. And so I wonder how much Fox paid for this. And I cannot find any info on that at all. Yeah, we probably will never find any info on that at all. Oh, my God. It's man. probably buried in a pauper's grave in Brooklyn somewhere. Oh, there's a great article, though, that says uh, CIA scientists did think that the fake Roswell alien autopsy bi- uh, video was real. And he had a memo that he sent out to, <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, I, I, re- I mean, I remember this like it was yesterday. Um, and I was, I mean, I was hyped to see it because I was like, you know, oh, my goodness, here's. Here's like the stuff that we're watching in X Files, basically coming true, you know. Yeah. So, listen to this. It says that former CIA scientist Kit Green was briefed three different times during and after his tenure at the CIA uh, on the topic of this video. The memo, believed to have been leaked from the archives of late astronaut Edgar Mitchell, states after Kit left the CIA, he was called into the Pentagon by person in uniform. The, pe- the person showed Kit the alien autopsy photos, reports, and video. The, uh, the cadaver Kit saw were consistent with the cadaver um, he said he had seen in the 1995 film. And there's like this memorandum, and he basically got God a second time. <laughs> <laughs> man yeah god i remember the alien autopsy thing i god so that's 95 so we were sophomores yeah sophomores, sophomores. man yeah. i bought into every bit of it yep i did too all right so moving on this is the case of the accidental time traveler oops i'm in 1844 <laughs> One night in 1950, a strange figure appeared in the middle of a traffic-clogged intersection in New York City's famous Times Square. He wore a high silk hat, a tight coat, and vest, and boasted an admiral set of thick mutton-chop sideburns. That's my buddy Parker. Well, you know what? In my mind, what I picture is the uh, the butcher from uh, Gangs of New York. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you know, (laughs) totally. Um, witnesses said the man looked startled, gawking at his surroundings as if he'd never seen a car or traffic lights before. He bolted for the curb, directly in the path of a yellow cab. You gotta watch out for those, they don't stop, according to Elf. Yeah. Which, kill, which killed him instantly. Oops. When the police searched the mystery man's pockets, they found 19th century currency a bill for the feeding and stabling of one horse, and a business card for Rudolph Fence of Fifth Avenue. Tracking down the address, they found an old woman who confirmed that Rudolph Fence was in fact her father-in-law, a man who had mysteriously disappeared in 1876. Such is the story of Rudolph Fence, the accidental time traveler. For decades, paranormalists across Europe have pointed to Fence's miraculous appearance, 
a 19th century man in 20th century Times Square as proof of the existence of time travel. So where, tr- where's, where's the rub here? Okay. But the true origin of the fence legend was a short story published in Collier's Magazine in 1951 by science fiction writer Jack Finney. The tale was republished in a paranormal journal two years later without attribution to Finney and presented as fact. <laughs> From there, the case of the accidental time traveler took on a life of its own. Oh, my God. So some idiot probably got handed a thing saying that they were out of ventilators at the hospital. <laughs> and they presented it as fact on as Twitter. As fact on Twitter. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. That that's nuts that somebody just found a short fiction story and was probably handed it and did no fact checking. Cause this yep. is 1950s. It's not like there's Google. Yeah. But and still there's, I mean, it's 1950s. They do have telephones. Well, yeah. I mean, apparently they contacted old Rudolph Fence's great granddaughter or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Jeez. All right. So uh, moving on, we got, now we have the British crop circles. This is another one that bothers me. So this is one that, and you know, I said in the beginning, I have one in here that is a little bit of a, of a turn in my opinion. So I'm going to read, read through this for anybody who's not aware. So in the 1980s, a series of increasingly intricate patterns emerged in the barley and wheat fields of surprised farmers in Wiltshire, England, dubbed crop circles. The breathtaking, unexplained formations drew crowds of gawking tourists and intense speculation about their origin. Serological, I can't say. I'm going to try seriologists. Uh, okay. Seriologist. Does that have anything to do with cereal? I don't Cereal Serialologists. Seri- I'll just say people. <laughs> As serious crop circle junkies are known, hypothesize that the circles which always appeared overnight, were either landing pads for alien spacecraft, coded messages from a higher intelligence, or symbols downloaded psychokinetically from the collective subconscious. It helps that Wiltshire is also home to Stonehenge, the original alien art project. Well, look at that. Didn't know that. Only Doug Bauer and Dave Corley knew the real story. The drinking buddies and part-time watercolor artists had been making the crop circles by hand, or by foot mostly, since the late 1970s. Fueled by too many pints and a conversation about UFOs, the duo snuck into a farmer's field and stomped out a circular pattern with iron rods to flatten a flattened wooden board and some rope. The rest is history. It wasn't until 1991 that Bauer and Corley confessed their role in the artistic hoax, which by then had grown to include legions of unaffiliated circle makers across England and around the world. The serology community took the news in stride, admitting the possibility that many of the circles were man-made, but ardently defending the most elaborate and beautiful circles as indisputably otherworldly creations. Now, I'm going to say that to me, these guys are the hoax. Yes. So these guys, this uh, Doug Bauer and Dave Corley, these guys are, they took advantage of this thing going on, created a method of doing it, and then went on TV and said, oh yeah, we did it, because if it's really aliens, the aliens aren't going to come and say, you're liars. We, we actually, you know, we, we actually yeah. made these. So, so I mean, they, they, it, it because I've actually watched a couple of different things where they show the method yeah. that these guys use, and then they go out to like one of the actual crop circles, and it looks completely different. Yeah, it's very, very different. The way that everything lays and is yeah. broken. Yep. Yeah. Um, along those lines, and the thing is, is a lot of people, a lot of skeptics who don't do research, assume that um, Bauer and Chorley were the first experiences of crop circles and that everyone else after that were copycats, but crop circles have been around since the 1600s. There, there's, there's documentation of crop circles in the 1600s. There's plenty in the 1960s and the 1930s. I mean, these, this is not something that they created. They, well, 
profited it off of it. Yeah. So it, again, I think in my opinion, you know, this, this was presented as the crop circles being the hoax, but in my opinion, these guys, they're the hoaxers. Correct. Correct. This to us, uh, this does not disprove crop circles. This just helps show that these guys figured out a way to copy. Yep. And, and actually, when you actually look at the way that their method works, it breaks the wheat or whatever, whereas the actual stuff, it's like it just laid over. Like it's yeah. not actually broken. It just laid down in whatever formation. Mm-hmm. Plus, I remember, I think there was a, I want to say Mythbusters episode where they tried to recreate this. And although they were able to get close to one of the circles that was created in England, it wasn't an exact match. It, yeah, it was not. And it, and it took like 10 people doing it. And they had like, they were like mapping it with all kinds of uh, like rule lines and stuff. And these guys were supposedly doing it at night in pitch black darkness. And yeah, I yeah. just, and I just that, don't buy it. And just mathematically perfect. And yeah, exactly. So I, I just know. don't, I just don't buy it. So yeah. Anyways, moving on. The uh, Cardiff Giant. This is known as America's Greatest Hoax. This 10-foot tall stone statue of a petrified ancient giant made its 19th century creator, George Hull, a very rich man. Yep. Hull was a get-rich-quick schemer and a proud atheist in a time of great religious fervor. After an argument with a... revivalist preacher over the existence of giants as mentioned in the book of Genesis Hull conceived a devious plan that would capitalize on the gullibility of the public in 1868 Hull hired a Chicago stonecutter to carve a massive hunk of gypsum in Hull's own likeness Hull then aged the stone with sulfuric acid and convinced a farmer in Cardiff, New York, to secretly bury it in his backyard. A year later, Hull had the farmer dig a well, instructing the workmen to dig exactly where the stone giant was buried. The unearthing of the Cardiff giant caused a great sensation sensation in upstate New York, still a hotbed of spiritual excitement. Remember the Fox sisters? Yeah. Yeah. this, this is, is around, you know, around the same time. The same yeah. time, yeah. Um, news of the creature spread far and wide, inciting fierce debate over artifacts on authenticity. Hall fanned the fires of speculation, taking the giant on tour and charging 50 cents for a peak. Rumor has it he made $30,000, which, as we just said, $1,500 around this time was about $45,000 today. So $30,000, extrapolate that out. I'm not doing the math right now, but it's a lot of money. It's probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If not, close to a million. Um, yeah, you can still see the Cardiff Giant at yep. the Farmer's Museum in Cooperstown, New York. You guys are going up there, right? No, we won't be up at New York. Okay. But well, we we had thought about actually going up that way and going to Niagara Falls and stuff, but we changed our mind. <laughs> okay, we're going to be going down and heading to Philly and going to Washington D.C. So everyone listening, that's my uh, vacation plans. Just letting you guys know. <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to try to find out as much haunted stuff as I can while I'm in Philly, Gettysburg, and Washington D.C. So, so yeah, those are our five. Um, hoaxes if you will in honor of april fools like i said some of those things are obvious hoaxes uh some of those things maybe not so up to you to decide yeah so uh old dude that did the cardiff giant he made off of this uh in terms of an inflation calculator for that time period uh eight hundred and sixty four thousand dollars wow so basically almost a millionaire off of that yep. yeah that's that's crazy man um well and i'm sure he's i'm sure he made some money selling it to the museum for sure oh sure and i'm sure they still get a cut his family yeah. gets cut you know uh I, I, just going back to the crop circles um and even this cardiff giant it's these people that created these hoaxes uh, including the fox sisters and stuff like that that take away any bit of legitimacy you know like we were talking about how um is the military creating aircraft that looks like ufos as a way to discredit it 
or are they creating aircraft that looks like UFOs because they've discovered the technology, right? And I, I think we we think that it's the the first, you know, that they're doing that as a way to discredit. Because all it takes is one thing for the whole yeah. movement to be discredited, right? right. You know, you got your British crop circles, this guy's showing you how to do it. Therefore, I mean, every article I'm looking up calls, it just says crop circle hoax. Right. They're saying well, it, all crop circles are hoaxes now. Well, it's, it's, it's like, um, any, it's just really weird. The, um, the like double, um, what's the word? double standard that I'm, that, mm -hmm. that is, that is around anything paranormal or, or sci-fi like that. So, right. you know, if you had, you know, if you take the same thing and apply it to the people who see the Virgin Mary and a fucking piece of toast, um, or even that, the, the children at Fatima, right? That is credible. And, and everybody agrees that, yes, that must've happened. And that's the, the Lord God speaking to us. Well, because yet, the Lord is mysterious and that's what the whole religion is all about is saying, you don't know, you have to just trust. Right. But I mean, you take the same thing and you apply it to the paranormal space or the sci-fi space. Right. And, you're and all crazy. of a sudden you're crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a double standard. Even and our I Christian, don't... even our, some of our Christian friends believe that about us, that we're crazy. Yep. You know, so it's unfortunate um, that we can't all just get along. Can't we all can't. just get along? So, um, but yeah, I want to wrap up because I know we've been going for quite a long time. Yeah. I do yeah. have a long listener story as well. Um, but that, yeah, that's our hoaxes. That's just five. There's a lot more that are out there. Um, we wanted to share that for April Fool's Day. I didn't realize I was going to get angry about everything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, that's that. We do have our uh, listener story coming up, like we said here. Um, just a reminder that you can always send in your story to uh, fearscapepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, this one, this story is a little bit of a longer one. Uh, this comes from a guy from our Haunted uh, History of Kentucky listeners. Uh, his name is Jerry Hiles Arkenbolt, uh, and he's got one heck of a story. So uh, we're going to go ahead and listen to this, okay? Back some 20 years or so ago, I had just got a car secondhand from a little old lady. It was a little Chevy Chevette. My cousin, which we'll call S, and a friend of ours, which we'll call D, were geared up for a road trip one Friday afternoon. I had just got off from work and filled up the gas tank for $9. How I wish I could still do that. Anyhow, we got on the road, headed down Mount Parkway. In a few hours, we were pulling off the highway onto a little two-lane road, then that winded down to one lane. After going by to see family and letting them know we were going up the mountain to camp, we headed up into the holler. Gravel most of the way, then through a shallow creek and then up a very steep hill as fast as we could. Scared to death the little car wouldn't make it. Finally, to the little one room cabin, which we just called a shack, we gathered wood and started a fire quickly as it was getting dark. I wanna add something here. No one lives within two miles or so and the gravel road is literally the only way to get in. Right after we got the fire started, we set up burgers and potatoes to cook. Then went to setting up cots in the shack. D was freaking out because he swore he had heard a woman's voice talking. He couldn't make out what she was saying, but he felt like she was sneaking around us the whole time. Neither me nor S heard anything as of yet. After we got set up, we all went to eat. Settling around the fire, just talking about whatever teenage boys talked about, and all of a sudden the flame went low, down to a small blue flame. We all got quiet and heard a woman say, You better watch how you talk to me. The three of us just sat looking at each other as if to say, Did you hear that? Not a word for about 15 minutes, looking around to see if we could find who had spoken. I finished my food and finally asked if they had heard that, and sure enough, we all heard the same thing. Nothing else happened, and we remained on edge but casually started talking again. At about 1 a.m., I got up and went off to bed. At 2 a.m., I woke up to my cousin pushing me out of bed saying, we got to get the hell out of there. I sit up and hear the worst commotion going on outside the cabin. So immediately, I reach for my 20 gauge, and S and D both behind me, we crack open the door. 
The fire's still going, but nothing as far as we could see, and not a sound to be heard. There were no frogs, no crickets, nothing. Just the fire. I pointed the gun toward the side of the hill and shot twice. Nothing. I thought it might have been a bear or a wolf, but there was still no sound of a scatter. We were parked nearly 75, maybe 100 feet from the cabin. Still at this point, I wasn't comfortable about making a dash just because I didn't hear whatever it was leave. And about five minutes go by as we sat there, and Dee starts complaining about how we're just going to stay there and get killed. Yet I didn't see him make a dash for the car. Then there were three knocks on the door. We all said, who is it? At the same time, no answer. I opened the door, nothing. And now I want to add something else. This was in autumn. You could hear anything walking around if they were actually walking around because of the dead leaves. But none of us heard anything. We decided to keep the fire going as it was almost out. Gun in hand, I spoke. If anyone is out there, I'm loaded. And you need to let me know you are here or I will shoot you. Still no answer. So we together go out and walk around the cabin and throw some logs on the fire. After what seemed forever, but was probably 10 minutes, the frogs and crickets started chirping again. We st snacked a little bit and started talking about how our imagination must have just got carried away and that we should get some sleep. We secured the fire once more and everybody just laid down and well, I fell asleep. Seems like I had just shut my eyes. And at that moment, I felt someone touch me. I opened my eyes and this shadow was standing over me, green eyes staring at me, and I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound, but in a woman's voice it said, You will not talk to me like that. And turned towards the door. I still couldn't move or say anything. I could see all around me, and D and S had wide eyes as well. The thing floated to the door, then turned around as the door opened. It screeched the highest pitch I had ever heard. You will die too! And then disappeared. Instantly, all three of us got up and out the door, dumping water on the fire and jumped straight into the car. We left them cots, we left clothes, D left his shoes, and I don't know what the hell else we left. But the little car that came off that hill sideways, never to go back. Not sure what that thing was or why this time it manifested itself, as I had been there many times. But I had been told that that mountain was haunted. I became a believer that night. Oh, and one other thing. When we were on the road, I looked at my watch. It was 3.55 a.m., and I honestly believe that 3.55 a.m. is the strongest time for spirits. This is a very true story. Wow. So definitely, you know, I want to say it's weird because I want to say that it's a mixture of night hag, but James was the, or Jerry, excuse me, was the only one that was afflicted by the night hag, uh, the, the sleep um, paralysis, but everyone else saw the creature as well. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting, man. And, and uh, yeah, I would get out of there and do, yeah. The, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Any time between um, three and four a.m. is yeah. a witching hour. Some people say three fifteen. Some people say three thirty-three. In fact, James actually said three thirty-three, but I, I said three fifty-five. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's just like definitely three in the morning is this yep. is this it is becoming the new witching hour it used to be midnight it you know like that everyone talked about the witching hour or 1 a.m but yeah now it's there's a lot of paranormal activity that seems to take place at uh, at that 3 a.m hour yeah so the next time that i'm able to stay up really late we should just you know try to do something at 3 a.m yeah well and it makes you wonder and this is going to sound really stupid but it's like do they uh, adhere to the time change <laughs> <laughs> and and if not which time of the year is the actual 3 a.m is it the one we're in now or around winter you know like which one so i'm gonna this is probably also equally gonna be stupid but i'm gonna apply to, i'm gonna try to apply some sort of logic and say that if they died after time change then their spirit might have 
Midas. So, ah, because they, okay. Then they, then they would have known it in life, and they might acknowledge it in death. If they died prior to that being a thing, then maybe not. Yeah. I don't know. This also strikes me, this story strikes me as a banshee. I, I know it happened in Kentucky, but there are a lot of Irish people in Kentucky. And uh, maybe this is a banshee story. I mean, the way she yeah. screeched and she said, you'll die too. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's very banshees prophetic. were all about yeah. saying, you know, you're going to die, but they didn't die, but they could right. have, maybe they could have, if they stayed, had the banshee not shown up and said, well, you know what? It's, 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 it's not a very good banshee because I mean, all people die eventually. So just saying you'll die too. I mean, yeah, I will one day. Uh, I mean, you don't know if they would have stayed. I mean, maybe that fire that they put out could have spread and hit the house and they could have roasted. So is it a warning of a threat or is it a warning of a cautionary tale? Uh, you can see me on video. Um, do I look like a banshee? Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> don't answer that. I don't know. We haven't done an episode on Banshees. Banshee. Yet, so. <laughs> I mean, we, we to, yeah. I mean, we, you know, back in the day, we made it part of our night hag, um, you know. I think they're distinct. Uh, yeah, they are very different because uh, they are, they are, uh, uh, they talk about an, an, uh, someone's going to die is essentially, they are essentially the precursor to death, like the Grim Reaper. You know, they they warn you. It's like a last minute warning. But I mean, again, is it kind of like Mothman in the in the sense that it was trying it's trying to warn you so that you could do something about it? Yeah, that's what I think. That's what I so, think. So, anyways, we'll yeah, get we got to get out of here. Yeah, some other time. Yeah, we got to get out of here. But uh, I wanted to remind you, if you have a listener story, please, please, please tell us that, or find us on one of these paranormal groups that we're on. Um, if you're listening because you saw the link there, let us know, um, or you can email us at fearscapepodcast at gmail dot com. Um, you know, or find us on our social media. We can do private messages there. We're at Fearscape Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, but yeah, uh, Josh, go ahead and tell them we want to talk about them. We're going to be pushing this a lot because um, we're getting a lot of really cool um, uh, interviews lined up via our friend Keith Age. You know, we already got Andrea Perrin, and uh, that was very much due to Keith Age. We've got some other ones lined up. I'm not going to um, spoil them yet. But we are wanting to expand. Um, we're wanting to do a lot of things. We're wanting to travel. We're wanting to do some stuff where, you know, as soon as this coronavirus has kind of allowed us back out and about, we want to head to places like Point Pleasant. Yep. We'd like to go on some hunts with Keith Age. He's invited us to Ohio and some other places that right. he wants us to go with him. We want to go up to I, some paranormal cons to visit Andrea yep. and Chip Coffee and people like that. Um, but those things cost money. And so how can they support us, Josh? Yeah, so if you jump out to our website, fearscapepodcast.com, there's a store on there where you can jump out and buy some really cool design merch, uh, T-shirts, mugs, uh, hats, those sorts of things. Um, you can also, we have Patreons. You can go over to our Patreon page and support us that way. There's some really uh, cool benefits that you get with the different Patreon tiers. I think uh, at the third tier and up, you actually get a free t-shirt. So Yeah, so this is a way for you to support us monthly. Um, even as low as $5, you can support us, right? Or even, is it is it five the lowest? Yeah, five is the lowest. $5. Yeah. I mean, that's the price of a cup of coffee a day. Um, you know, uh, that the really, eyes of an angel. <laughs> that really <laughs> helps us. I mean, that just helps us cover expenses, you know, like yeah. our um, recording equipment. I'm going to be moving to Arizona soon, so I have to purchase recording equipment. Um, so that we can do different things so that we can continue to record like we're doing now on Zoom. Yep, so, so. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to be getting some people when we're out in Arizona. Let me tell you, I'm going to find Travis Walton. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, go to our Patreon page. That's linked on the website as well, correct? It is. It is. It is. And also visit our guest page and check out all of their books and stuff like that. Um, just just yep. different ways that you can support us. So, Yep. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we really appreciate the listener support. Just listening and keeping the show going is great. But if you, if you really like the content that we're delivering, if you really like the, the, the relationship that we have, the, the electricity that we have on the show, uh, and you know, you, you're not just listening to us tell you about some uh, article that we read about, right? You're, you're getting that electricity from the show. If you really enjoy that, please consider supporting us either, you know, buying some shirts or uh, supporting us on Patreon. 
And also, if you like that and you want to see more, check out our YouTube page. Uh, that's youtube.com slash Fearscape Media, but it's also linked on the website. We've got special YouTube only content that is on there Fearscape Unhinged, which is our YouTube show where we talk theories and we kind of let our uh, loosen our belts a bit and let loose and talk about things uh, as well as we've been trying to do some more paranormal things we've been doing some Estes sessions and things like that so we're um, sharing those on YouTube as well um, but most of all just follow us follow us yep. on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and subscribe and all that stuff and I'm going to quit talking now yep and last but not least share please share with yeah. your friends oh, and share <laughs> just just tell everybody that you know. Go go tell it on the mountain. Yeah, that's the best way. That's the best thing you can do for us <laughs> since we can't afford big billboards in every city. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to get out of here. Um, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. We love you guys so much. We love our blanket huggers. Uh, we are in the process of trying to find a way to get you guys to get some uh, blankets yourself, some Fearscape blankets. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but yeah, like we said, we're going to get out of here. April Fool's Day, everybody. I um, hope you enjoyed our hoaxes. Um, and stuff like that. But uh, this has been Stefan, and I will catch you on the flip side, everybody. This has been Josh. The truth is out there. And remember, folks, hold those blankets extra tight as things tend to get spooky when you're listening to Fearscape. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'm so glad you were able to join us for that horrifying discussion. I hope they didn't frighten you too much <laughs> tune in next week for even more research into the nightmarish and haunting creeps and spooks that we tell ourselves don't exist but we know they do make sure you have your blankets that you hold them extra tight next time on Fearscape. Ha 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 ha